In de naam van de Almachtige God, de Barmhartige, de Genadevolle. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Kijkers, welkom terug voor het tweede deel met Sayyid Mohammed Baqar al Qazwini. I will switch to English now. In this topic, we will discuss the challenges and difficulties of Muslims in the West in this day and age. Muslims globally, but especially in the West. Welcome Sayyidna. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for joining us again. Thank you, it's my pleasure. And we start with something which is at my heart and what I'm very afraid of, uh, doubts in the existence of God. With a lack of religious inspiration and strength, there hides a great danger. Doubts in the existence of God and religion, uh, attraction to scientific reasoning and atheism. How do we cope with this as Muslims? Where can we fall back on when we have that dip in Iman? One of the challenges today that we are having is Muslims doubting the Holy Quran and doubting our belief system, even if it's the existence of God. And as more and more scientific advancements are made, the less some people are believing in religion because they think that science is disproving religion. I have science, what do I need religion for? I've heard some people even tell me, religion was useful back in the dark ages when we could not explain the universe. Now we can explain everything. I know why rain falls, why the rain changes to snow, why you have thunder, why you have lightning, how the world of atoms work, how humans are basically reproducing, how the planets work. I don't need religion to explain anything to me because I have science that's beautifully explaining it to me. Why do I need religion? Some people have these doubts and they really do think that science is disproving religion. Mm -hmm. Muslims who are struggling with these ideas, these thoughts, these burdensome doubts, what do they do? Because they are burdensome. I know people who go through depression because of this. People who come to me saying, I've been doubting the existence of God, I can't sleep. I'm not at peace, I don't know why, what can I do? How can I start addressing these doubts? Based on my experience, I will give the following recommendations. Number one, it's very important for us Muslims to know that the same creator who created this physical world, who created science, is the one who created our religion and gave us our religion. They have the same source. Mm -hmm. If you think there's a discrepancy, it's because you have not understood it. Simply by understanding religion and understanding science, you see that they point you to the same source. That's very important for us to remember. So don't just quickly give up because you've not understood something. Oh, this science has disproved that. Wait, investigate it. I remember I had a conversation with a Muslim who had left the religion of Islam. I asked him why. He said, because the Quran and religion tells us that Adam is the first human being and he lived, what, maybe 10,000 years ago, say 20,000 years ago. Whereas science is finding the fossils, the bones of human-like figures that go back to a million years ago, mm. two million years ago, like the fossils of the famous Lucy. Mm. So I know religion is false. Quickly, I asked him a question that changed his life. I told him, who told you Islam says Adam is the first human being. Where are you getting this from? Can you show me the verse? He couldn't. Can you show me the hadith? He couldn't. Then I shared with him the hadiths and the verses that either clearly indicate or hint that there were human-like figures before Prophet Adam See, he did not understood this religious concept. He started doubting God and doubting religion. Anyone who struggles with doubt the best way to counter that, to combat that, is go and learn. Ask a scholar. Understand the depths of the Qur'an. Go back to the Qur'an. The Qur'an is very simple in giving you the reality of this life. Don't overcomplicate things. It's very simple at its core. So I invite those people, especially in the West, who are, um, you know, being burdened by all these doubts, Go and see what the Qur'an has to offer and especially the Ahlul Bayt. Read the book of Kafi and see how the Imams would debate those atheists. 
The Imams constantly had debates with them, read them. Mm -hmm. Someone who becomes an atheist, what wonders me is, have you ever read one of those debates? Have you ever opened the book of Kafi to see what Imam al-Sadiq had to say about that? Usually not. Mm -hmm. And that, that's not fair. Go read and then you can make the decision. So the more we gain knowledge and we gain religious understanding, the more we go back to the basics of deen, the more we will have clarity in this world. Why is there evil in this world? You know, there are people who leave religion because they cannot understand why there is evil. Why are babies born with defects? Why does God allow these wars when He could stop them? You've not understood the system. Read the Quran. Allah tells you in Surah Al-Mulk, Life is a trial. Yes, there is good, there is evil. But Allah gave you free will because He has given you honor. You're not a robot that God wants you to be forced to choose. God wants you to willingly choose. And that's beautiful. Life is training. God is giving you an opportunity to be trained. That's beautiful. Now when you're being trained, obviously there's bad around you. You have to navigate your way. That's why you're being trained. Understanding the philosophy of life by expanding your knowledge will relieve you from these doubts. Ascent, ascent. And we can use science as uh, an, an, a backup to understand the religion more, to a um, more certain. You can use science to increase, increase your faith your in faith. God. Ascent. Absolutely. Ascent. That's what I meant. Uh, and unfortunately, with it being one of the greatest challenges, the doubts in the existence of God, the doubt in religion, we have many more struggles, unfortunately, and many more difficulties which are in conflict with our religion but are now being propagated and one of them which had a huge rise and increase in the last couple of years and this year I maybe say the peak of, of, of propaganda is the LGBTQ agenda and movement and advertisement. Uh, it has reached new heights and of course it's in conflict with our religion and our moral code but how can uh, we as Muslim youth, as teenagers, as youngsters who are exposed to this in our schools, uh, in our social lives, on social media, how can we cope with this and defend our principles as Muslims without losing our reputation, our society? Because we have nothing against them, it's against our religion um, and more important how to protect our children and increase their knowledge and arming them to defend their rights as Muslims but at the same time being tolerant and not having the label of being intolerant in their societies. Here is how I would tackle this dilemma. Yeah. I would say to anyone who's interested in the Islamic perspective on LGBTQ, for instance, or homosexuality in general, I would say to everyone out there who wants to hear us the following. I would say I love this country because it grants me the freedom of thought and the freedom of, of expression. We are diverse, we have different opinions. Being a citizen, a good citizen, doesn't mean that you are forced to follow someone's ideas and ideologies. We have freedom of expression here. As long as I'm not advocating for violence, I'm not dehumanizing, I'm not causing hatred in society and destabilizing society, I have the right to express myself. So you see those groups out there who are trying to silence us, they are the ones who are confiscating our right of freedom of expression. Don't you believe in freedom of expression? Allow me to express myself. I have the right to express myself. Why is it that when I express myself, suddenly I am the bad one? Doesn't this country guarantee me this right? The constitution, does it guarantee me the right to express myself? So listen to what I have to say. You don't have to accept it. But the beauty is we can sit together and we could academically discuss it. It doesn't mean I have to support everything in society. That's one very important point I'd like to share. The second way I would tackle that is the following. When you allow society to decide moral values for you, you're not looking at a fixed foundation. Society changes every day. 
50 years ago in the US, homosexuality was seen as a psychological disorder. It was officially in the manual of disorders. In the 1970s, they took it off. So was society right back then? Or today when it's encouraging it? Or 50 years when God knows what will happen? There is no fixed foundation. Why are you bullying me and forcing me to accept something that's ever changing? When I have my own moral principles, is that fair? Honestly, is that fair, fair to impose fair, that fair, on yeah. someone? I want to have a fixed moral foundation that, that gives me confidence. I don't have confidence in something that keeps changing. You have confidence in it, that's fine, I respect that. But you don't have the right to impose it on me. I have the right to say what is a moral lifestyle? What is a moral family structure that's healthy, that's good? Honestly, I really feel bad for many people who have, a vict have been a victim of, of, of some of these agendas. I have seen statistics, research by scientists, for instance, people who, transgenders, right, who change their gender, and no yeah. way am I judging them here. Yeah. But there are, there's a lot of research that's showing that this is affecting their psychological health. Those people who change their gender, especially children, and they're pushing this on children. You don't feel comfortable with your gender, just go and have a, uh, you know, a, a, get, get surgery done and you can change your sex or you can even change your gender, right? Yeah, yeah. A lot of them are struggling from depression, anxiety. Studies have shown that for a lot of them, it gets worse. The suicide rate gets higher. Some of them, they regret doing that. You know, there are teenagers right now without parental consent. In some US states, they can go to a clinic and do gender conversion therapy wow. without parental consent. And some of them are suing those clinics when they grow up. Wow. There was this, uh, this girl who sued the clinic she basically said, I was a child. I didn't know any better. Why did you allow me to change my sex? And you had, you know, this invasive surgery done on me. It goes against their own democracy and morals. Why, why did that happen? Now, why am I forced to come and accept this? Mm -hmm. When I'm not convinced that this is the best for my society. Respect my stance. When it comes to the LGBTQ issue, we do not dehumanize. They are fellow citizens. We peacefully live with them. We do not dehumanize them. We do not incite hatred or violence against them. However, we do not see that this is the moral lifestyle that God wants for us and all the prophets of God, since Adam, Abraham, until Moses, Jesus, and Prophet Muhammad. None of them advocated for homosexuality. In fact, they said that this is not the moral lifestyle that God wants for you. Now, if someone wants to choose that, that's fine. That's their choice. Mm -hmm. I respect that you have your own choice in society, but it doesn't mean that I encourage this choice because I believe this choice has consequences. Mm -hmm. Why should I impose that on my family, on my f future generation? That would be unfair. Mm -hmm. And if you really believe in freedom of expression, respect my opinion. Mm -hmm. But today, today, unfortunately, the minute you don't show your support, they invent all these labels against you. You're, you, I've, I've heard that you're a racist. I've heard, I've heard this in schools, right? Excuse me, can you define racism for me? How is that being racist if I don't support homosexuality? Homosexuality is an act. It's a practice, right? What does that have to do with racism? Well, then they started to invent another label, homophobe. You're a homophobe right now. Labels should not intimidate us. If something is true in our opinion, we have to hold on to it. We have to hold on to the moral values that we have for our children. And we have to discuss this with our children. What I would say, especially to Muslim families, your child is five, six, seven, talk to them, talk to them about this issue. Because if you don't, the school is, the teacher is, the cartoon is, the, the movie that they're seeing is. It's much better for you, the parent, to be the first one to have this conversation with your children than to have others educate them about this. Tell them, Baba, we live in a world where people have different lifestyles. That's fine. People can do whatever they want. But this is our lifestyle because this is the moral way. This is what God wants from, what God and the Quran wants from us. This is the way that is uh, the most psychologically healthy way for us to live. So understand you will go to school tomorrow, you will hear about these issues. 
Don't get confused. Our path is clear. We hold on to our path. And people would like to live in different ways. That's completely okay. It's their right. Talk to your children about it. Yeah. Let them make sense of what's going on. Some parents will disagree with me. Tell me, so no, say it. Yeah, my child is too young. I don't want to use these terms and words with, with them. Well, the reality is your teacher is. Yes. Whether you like it or not. Society is whether you like it or not. So at least you be the first one so we don't cause confusion. There is mass confusion right now amongst our younger generation. They honestly don't know how to navigate this because at home nobody talks about it. Taboo, be quiet. You're not allowed to talk about it. Even in some mosques, in some uh, community centers, you're not allowed to talk about it, by the way. I know some places, they'll not allow you to talk about it. No, 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 please don't talk about this. We have families and kids over here. Don't talk about this. Mm. Of course, we're assuming that the speaker is addressing it appropriately. There might be some speakers who address it inappropriately. We, we reject that. Mm -hmm. But it's a taboo in some communities. Definitely. Okay, fine. If it's a taboo here, your child is going to learn in school. And then they will get confused. It creates an identity crisis. And that's why we're seeing very high rates of anxiety, depression, and even suicide amongst our generation. Because they're honestly lost. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine a child who's five, six, seven, or eight. Now they have to choose their gender, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. On top of all these other things that you choose, now you have to choose your gender. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, a child at the age of five, six, seven, how much do they know about gender for them to make a choice? Is that an informed decision? Well, not do you allow a child to make a decision when it comes to their surgery? Mm. Baba, there's three surgeries here that you can do. Choose one of them. <laughs> Who does that? See, that's my perspective. Illogical, yes. You disagree, that's fine. Yeah. You want your child to experiment with those surgeries? By all means, do it with your child. Yes. I'm not responsible don't for you, it on but me. don't impose it on me. Mm -hmm. I don't want my child to experiment with these surgeries, right? Yes, yes, yes. These are important things. You know what gender means? Do you know how many ramifications and consequences there are when you choose a gender? Yeah. Honestly, does a child know all of them? All of them? Mm -hmm. And we're burdening them. them. We're burdening them. Yeah. I have the right to come and say, I don't want my children to be burdened. Don't call me a, a homophobe, racist. That's not going to change the reality. I, I'm looking for the well-being of my children because I care. I want the best for my society. But yes, I will not dehumanize you. Yeah. I will not incite violence against you. Yes. But I respectfully disagree with you. Disagree. And it's okay to respectfully disagree. That's yeah. the beauty of a democracy. Yeah. That's, a beauty, that's the beauty of a free country, free country, that we can respectfully disagree with one another. Exactly. So that, that is how I would look at this discussion. But we have to have these conversations with our youth and with our children. Tell them what God says in the Quran, how we view it, why we need to have a fixed moral foundation. So they're not confused when they go out there. And beautifully said, now it really isn't a time to don't discuss taboos anymore because we face many challenges and we just does, did just discuss the top of the iceberg. And unfortunately, there are many more, and we only there are many more layers to, many the, discussion, more layers to the discussion and many more struggles and challenges we face. This is just the top of the iceberg. And another one which has got some attention lately in the last couple of years in the COVID years is depression which you already mentioned a couple of times uh, in the time of covid the rise of the depression was huge due to obvious reasons uh, and also in our communities we saw a huge rise of depression and anxiety and it became more and more a topic of discussion also on the pulpits in our centers alhamdulillah and how do we look at re a depression from a religious viewpoint. Do we have a hadith from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu and the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam would talk about depression like we know it now? Uh, and have they given us the tools to fight it or to heal from it? Sajjad, what do you think is the biggest killer of teenagers and young adults, adults today, especially in the West? What is the biggest killer? I think is social it, media. Social media, <laughs> yes indeed. <laughs> But it's not car accidents, no. it's not heart disease, it's not any physical disease, mm. it's psychological diseases. Yeah. Specifically loneliness, depression, anxiety, mm. and suicide. Mm. And social media is not helping at all, it's exacerbating it's all of that. Cause, yeah. It's a huge cause. And so many studies have shown 
that there are many youth, the more they use social media, the more they use Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, the worse they feel. The more they're left with a feeling of loneliness. So definitely social media is a big cause of all these psychological challenges that we're, we're facing. But that is the biggest challenge of this generation and it's on the rise. Every few days I read a study in the New York Times and you know some other journal, scientific journal for instance, that says depression is on the rise and this generation is not happy. Mm. In fact, just recently one article in the US, you know, considered this generation right now to be the unhappiest generation that we've ever known uh -huh. since, you know, scientists started to actually gauge happiness. Mm. Why? Our younger generation have everything at their disposal today. All the modern the family. gadgets yeah. and the toys and the tools and the material mm -hmm. comfort that our kids have, our grandparents would not dream of, of it. would not dream of it. Mm. So Jad, I heard this from my own grandfather. May Allah prolong his life and bless Ameen. him. Ameen. He said when he was a child in Karbala, we're, we're talking about like 80 years ago, 85 years ago. <laughs> he said his father, meaning my great grandfather, one day due to excessive poverty in Karbala and lack of food, he went to the shrine of Imam Hussein السلام, and he prayed Salat al -Ju'ah, the prayer of hunger. Sajjad, have you ever heard of this prayer in your never, life? Never, never. Why not? Because no. we've never experienced we faced it. it yes. You know there is a prayer in Islamic law called Salat al -Ju. It's mustahab Most to pray it when you're going through hunger. My grandfather said we literally didn't have anything at home. Subhanallah. And he went to pray this prayer. That's how they lived and mm. that's how we live. And, and still we're not we're satisfied. We're the unhappiest, wow. And when we want something mm -hmm. and we click buy, we want it instantly. Yes, instantly. Do you have Amazon here in the, in, yeah, yeah. In the Netherlands or similar of companies? Course, yes, yes. Yeah, I want same day shipping. Shipping, yeah. yeah. And have you seen the kids? Yeah. If it's delayed for two hours, oh, we've got a problem <laughs> in the house. Yeah. You see them, their attitude changes. Oh no, it's shipping tomorrow. It was supposed to come Monday, now it's Tuesday. This generation is really suffering, Spoiled. unfortunately. Yeah. And, and we have to do something about that because depression is really on the rise. Mm. Now, there are clinical ways of treating depression. Mm. And we as Muslims should not reject that. I see some people who say, if you're a Muslim, you have Iman, you can never go to a therapist. That's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Just like when you get sick, you have an infection, you go to a doctor, doctor. you take antibiotics. Sometimes if it's uh, chronic depression, anxiety, you need to see a doctor. Yes. But see a qualified doctor, doctor yeah. see a doctor who has good reviews. Mm -hmm. Don't just go to any doctor. One, one brother in the US, he told me, Sayyid, you know why I, I'm not going to a therapist anymore? I told him why. He's like, I went to a therapist, he was sitting and eating chips and he wasn't really interested in what I was saying. I'm not going there anymore. Yeah. I told him, don't judge all therapists. We have good therapists and maybe we have those types of therapists. Of course. Don't judge. Yes. But go to a good therapist, it's completely okay. Some people are scared of going to a therapist because their friends will think they're crazy. Oh, if you're seen going into that clinic, oh, this person's crazy, has psychological problems. See, the problem is we also label people. We stigmatize them. Mm -hmm. And that's wrong. That needs to be, that, that, that needs to change. Mm -hmm. So we as Muslims, we accept the clinical treatments. I myself, when people come to me seeking help for depression, the first thing I ask them, have you seen a doctor? Have you seen a psychologist, a psychiatrist? a therapist, cognitive therapist for instance. Mm. Have you seen them or not? You've been struggling all this time, why didn't you see a therapist? Yes. So that's the first step. Honestly, you should get professional help. Yeah. I cannot stress that enough. But is professional help always enough? No. Sometimes we have a spiritual void. That only religion can fulfill to you. Mm. And here is where we have the Quran and the Hadith telling us about the spiritual remedy to, to depression. We have, we have hadiths that talk about chronic depression. You know, uh, grief and sorrow that becomes excessive. Hmm. Now back then they didn't really have a term, term for, for it. these new labels, right? Yes, yes. But the idea was there. We have in our hadith amazing literature about that. Hmm. Let's, let's explore that. Let's examine the stories of the Quran. I believe if you contemplate the stories of the Quran, a lot of what we see in terms of depression and anxiety can be cured. Yes. I'll give you one example. 
One day a young man came to see me in my office in Michigan. He told me, say it, I developed a disability recently, maybe like two, three years. My own family members, cousins and friends mock me sometimes. I can't take this anymore. And I decided to commit suicide. But I thought, let me come and see you. Maybe you have something mm -hmm. to say. Now, imagine someone tells you that, right? It's, it's very difficult to be in that situation. And what kind of advice are you going to give mm -hmm. this person? So I realized the problem was his family was bullying him because of his disability, disability. which is so sad. Very People sad. with a disability, you should help them. You should care for them, not bully them. I told him, you've read the Quran, right? He's like, yes, I've read the Quran. I told him the Quran has a lot of beautiful stories, but what is one of the most beautiful stories of the Quran for you? He said, Prophet Yusuf السلام, his story. I told him exactly, why is it beautiful? Can you explain it to me? I walked him through the story of Prophet Yusuf. I told him, here you have the grandson of who? Ibrahim al-Khalil, the son of Yaqub, the son of Ishaq, the son of Ibrahim. He's not a normal child. And he has 11 brothers. They're all the sons of a prophet. His own brothers bully him. They gang up on him. Initially, they try to kill him. Then what do they do? They throw him in a well. Does that stop there? No. They sell him as a slave. Then he goes to the palace of Zulaikha and the whole predicament with Zulaikha starts. Then he spends seven years in prison. Now someone may look at that. Where is God? Yeah. What's going on? You have such a pure Yusuf and for the first 40 years of his life, he's going through misery. Allah is basically telling you, wait. Don't judge the movie before you've seen the movie. <laughs> wait. Can you judge the movie at minute 40? Finish the movie. Finish the movie. And then subhanAllah, he becomes the minister of Egypt. Allah reunites his family. His brothers bow for him, before him. I told him, see, his brothers bullied him. Wow. But Allah elevated him. Don't lose hope. Beautiful. He broke in tears. He broke in tears. He told me, Sayyid, you saved me with these words. I was going to commit suicide. You saved me. That's it. I had read the story of Yusuf, but I never thought about it that way. No. See, that, that is our spiritual remedy. Why do you think Allah tells you these stories in the Quran? You're getting bullied by your family? Habibi, there's a prophet who was bullied by his own family, by his brothers. That's a lesson. That's a beautiful lesson. Munajat of Imam Zain al Abidin. You know, sometimes when you feel scared, anxiety, there's a munajat called what? Out of the 15th, Munajat al Khaifi. Why? Because Imam Zain al Abidin is teaching you, you go through emotional states. Don't let that build up in your heart. Release it before God. Not before people, because people may misunderstand you and you'll regret it. I, I wish I'd not poured my heart before this person. He misunderstood me. He belittled me, but Allah will never. You feel scared, anxious, you have anxiety? Read Munajat al Khaifin with contemplation. Munajat al Muhabbin. If you have a crisis in terms of love and it's uh, a love, relationship that's causing your depression, for Heartbreak. instance. Yeah, yeah. Read Munajat al khaifin mm. SubhanAllah, these 15 Munajat, they each examine our emotional state and they address it. That's one remedy. Wow. That's one remedy. What, one of the most beautiful hadiths that talk about grief and sorrow is the hadith that states, Allah loves a sad heart. Inna Allah yuhibbu al-qalb al hazin I think if people who struggle with not severe depression, but mild depression know this, this will make them more positive. Yes. See, we have purposeful sorrow, which makes you serious and it makes you prepared for the hereafter. That's good. Allah loves a sad heart. A sad heart looks at the world. It sees suffering and pain. Let me do something. Let me bring a smile to the face of an orphan. See, it's that sorrow in your heart that led you there. That's beautiful. So I would say to people who struggle with some levels of sorrow, let that sorrow be fuel for you to act more, to do something. That's beautiful. So we have all these spiritual remedies. Honestly, I invite our youth to seek them. Read these beautiful du'as that we have from the Ahlul Bayt. The sujood, the power of sujood. Allah says in the Holy Quran to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that we know that your chest becomes tight because of what they say. Meaning depressed. That's another way of saying depressed. depressed your chest becomes tight. Yes. What should you do, Ya Rasulullah, when they do that to you? Go and fight them? No. 
فسبح بحمد ربك وكن من الساجدين. Go into sujood and say, Oh Allah, I glorify you and I thank you. And I've shared this with my brothers and sisters. I tell them five minutes before you sleep, do sujood, take a deep breath and just say, Subhan Rabbi Laala wa bihamdi. One sister told me I did that, I felt like a mountain was lifted from my chest. This is the beauty Amazing. of our religion. Amazing. So seek professional help, but don't underestimate like spiritual, spiritual help. help. Ah, Sensei, no, beautifully. You completely changed also my view, not only to Surah Yusuf, but you gave me so much more insights, and I hope the brothers and sisters as well, which we can benefit from. And we also have a hadith, I think, which says the dua of one who is in a state of misery, in a state of gharik, dua al gharik. Allah will answer, answer their it. prayers. It yes. expedites. Expedites, yes. yes. That's the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Beautiful, beautiful. And to get back on the point of social media, today, alhamdulillah, you, you have decades of experience in the hawza and you're also a loving father of five beautiful children uh, who have experienced living in Iran, in the US, and now, alhamdulillah, they're living in the city of Imam Ali alayhi salam. But they're in, they are in, crucial, in a crucial age. Uh, I think teenagers and younger than teenagers. Uh, how do you deal with them with your own upbringing as experienced, with the religious knowledge you have now, and with the experience of living in the West and of course social media. Every kid nowadays has an iPhone, an iPad, where they're exposed to all the dangers, like the agendas which are in conflict with the Islam. How do you deal with that and what kind of tips could you give new young parents as one of them is in our studio, Sayyid Ali. MashaAllah. <laughs> yes. We have to talk to our youngsters and convince them of the danger out there. Mm. The problem with a lot of parents when it comes to their children, social media, access to the internet, when the parents restrict their access or they take away their iPad, their tablet, the child thinks, mom and dad don't trust me. Mm. When a child thinks that the parents don't trust him, he or she is shattered. That's wrong. The way that I handled it with my children, I had a conversation with them. I told them, first of all, Baba, you convince me why you need an iPhone. Mm. One day, my 10-year-old daughter, my eldest daughter, she came back from school, 10, 10 years old. I mean, imagine. She told me, Abba, can you buy me an iPhone? Hmm. I told her why. She was like, please, just buy me an iPhone. I said, I will buy you an iPhone, but write me an essay, convince me. You have a tablet. Hmm. If it's about schoolwork, you can do it. Yeah. What is it that you need to do on an iPhone that you can't on your iPad? If you convince me, if it's convincing, I'll buy it for you. I gave her a chance to express herself. Maybe some conservative families, no, that's it, stop, don't ever bring this anymore. That's wrong. Let your child express themselves. So she went to her room, obviously she couldn't come up with a paragraph to convince me. What is she going to say? <laughs> so she came back and, please, Baba, get me the iPhone. I'm like, just tell me why. At the end, I realized why. She told me, everyone in my class has an iPhone. Mm. I told her, wait a minute, wait a minute. Your classmates, 10 years old, and all of them have an iPhone? She's like, yes, I'm the only one who doesn't. I'm like, oh my God, what are parents doing? They're destroying their kids. Why do you need to give an iPhone to your 10 year old child? Just because you have the money to buy it, it means you have to get them an iPhone. And then tomorrow you come and you cry, I've lost my child, my child to become a drug addict, my child this, my child that. Who told you to give them an iPhone? And I explained it to her, why she doesn't need an iPhone. Yeah. I gave her the chance to express herself, she couldn't. Mm. So she accepted. Initially, it was bitter for her, but then she accepted. And later she thanked me for it. Mm. See, you have to have, uh, you know, some sort of structure in your family. Awesome. Convince your children. That's number one. Number two, none of my children have social media accounts. You might think this is extreme, come on, who doesn't have a TikTok account? Look, I deal with families every day. I'm an unofficial therapist for family <laughs> problems. And I see what social media is doing to our children. You want to see something on Instagram that's important here? Use mommy's phone, use daddy's phone, go and see it. But for you, 
to have your own account and you're sitting in your room 24 7 I don't know what you're up to I'm not an irresponsible father for me to do that impossible so I beg the young parents don't give unrestricted access to your children when it comes to social media why does a seven-year-old child need to have a social media account why why does he need to have a TikTok account or Instagram account do you know who's talking to them do you know who's privately sending them a message there was a family who's like no 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 we'll monitor it well a disaster happened and it turns out that every time that bad friend would send him a message he would delete it so he does so mom and dad doesn't see it. see it look you think you can outsmart your kids no you cannot technologically they're much savvier than you are so do yourself a favor do your children a favor don't let them have social media accounts they don't need it it's too dangerous out there and tell your child it's not because I don't trust you I trust you but I don't trust those bad people out there just like the COVID you know the, the example I give is COVID when COVID happened, imagine someone says, you know, I'll go out there, you know, and I'm strong. And what, you don't trust me if I go to the, the supermarket? Mm. What kind of a response is that? A, a parent will tell the child, I trust you. Mm. I don't trust the virus. <laughs> the virus might, yeah, you know, yeah. come and impact you. I don't Good trust example. everyone out there in the world of social media. So why should I let my children become victimized? Parents, be strong. Don't let your young children have social media accounts. Mm -hmm. You cannot control it. Believe me, you cannot. Mm -hmm. They will outsmart you. They'll find ways to connect with other friends. And before you know it, they are, they're being influenced day and night. So that is something that I did with my children. Yes, they have a tablet. They could do their work on it. Some, you know, uh, games that are not harmful. Don't restrict the kids too much. Give them some freedom. time, to freedom to play. That's okay. Yeah. But from day one, I told them, you don't need the social media accounts. And I convinced them and they accepted. And Alhamdulillah, Allah protected us from that. Another strategy that's really helpful at home, and I've tried this with my children, pray jama'ah together. Doesn't take too much time. You have to pray anyway. Yeah. Gather them, pray jama'ah, and then between the prayers or after the prayers, five minutes talk to them. Talk to them, see what's on their mind, say a nice story, share a hadith. Hadith of the day, verse of the day, share it with them. It's a beautiful moment to bring the family together, to pray together, and then they'll be excited. Today there's going to be, to be, there's going to be a new story. And you have to, by the way, prepare for that moment. Some parents make it very boring. I myself, I couldn't last in those gatherings. Yeah. I'd probably fall asleep. Make it interesting for your kids. Prepare today, what am I going to say? This is, a, this is more important than your work. This is more important than your business. This is your eternal investment. Spend 20 minutes coming up with something nice to say to your children. If you do that, you will see amazing changes. Sent. Beautiful, Sayyidina, beautiful. So you're not vulnerable for uh, puppy tears of your dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's not easy. I mean, when they come and they're upset, I mean, I'm a father, I have a heart. Yeah. I feel bad, yeah. but I cannot give her something that's poisonous. You have to protect them. I but I try my best to convince her. That's beautiful. And we need to convince them. And you can't. Try enough, you'll be able to convince that's them. Sense. Do research. Yeah. Do research. One thing that I did, I went online yeah. and I came up with articles by American researchers. Here are the 10 negative effects or impacts or consequences of giving iPhones to kids under 14. Mm -hmm. Here are 10 negative impacts of Facebook. I'm like, Baba, read this. Yeah. I didn't come up with these statistics. Yeah. Read them. She read them. Wow, I didn't know that. Mm. Share this with your children. So parents have to be educated. They have to be aware and they have to do the research. Ahsan, beautiful. And to build a bridge, uh, we are not only building bridges between people at New Association, but also between topics. Um, I think a reason people, not particularly your youth or kids, but elder people are so exposed and so grasped and attracted to social media is because a lack of purpose i think and we as muslims know what our purpose is because surah 51 verse uh, 56 about we created the jinn and the human to worship to worship <laughs> we know what our purpose in life is but human beings in general and even muslims nowadays 
live their lives without a meaning and purpose. Uh, for us as believers, this is questionable, but materialism, meaning and essence of life, worldly desires have blinded the human being. And social media taught us that wealth, fleshy and expensive good, uh, outer uh, expression, beauty, uh, a nice outer appearance, followers and likes and fame are the essence of life. But we as Muslims need a wake-up call. And what are the tools to not get distracted from the true essence of meaning and not going astray from the path that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for us? A recent Harvard study showed that people who had a sense of purpose mm -hmm. in this life, they knew what their purpose is. They were much happier and their psychological health was much better. Mm -hmm. This reveals that when you don't have a clear purpose, a sense of purpose, and you're waiting for all these external things to fill you and fulfill you mm -hmm. and satisfy you, you will suffer from depression, from anxiety, from lack of happiness. A sense of purpose is what brings peace to your heart. My message to this generation is, before you preoccupy yourself with anything, before you pursue anything, figure out what your purpose is. Why am I here? Am I just some accident in this universe? Some evolutionary accident that happened in this universe? Or do I have a purpose? What is that purpose? Figuring out that purpose is extremely important in guaranteeing your mental health. A lot of people, they resort to drugs, they resort to gambling, to all that time on social media is because they don't know what their purpose is. Hmm. They have free time and so they're fulfilling it. And by the way, if you have a lot of free time, honestly, that means you don't know what your purpose is. Because if someone really knows what their purpose is, they don't have that much free time. Have you ever seen someone studying for their bar exam, meaning the law exam, or someone studying for their MCAT, we call it in the US, to become a doctor? doctor. Do they have a lot of free time? Why not? They're busy studying. For They're their... busy, they have a goal. Yeah, yeah. When you have a goal, a clear goal, you never have too much free time. Having a lot of free time that you're filling with social media means you don't have a sense of purpose. Figure out what that purpose is. It will bring you happiness. This dunya will not bring you happiness. Just last year in the month of Muharram, a young man who's finish finishing his PhD in IT came after the majlis and he saw me. He told me, Sayyid, I would like to share with you my personal experience. I came from another country. When I came here, and my family's pretty wealthy, so materialistically I can get what I want. The best car, you know, the best everything. I committed every sin you can think of. Partying, indulging in my desires, whatever my desire would say, I would say yes. I committed so much haram, so much haram. But now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided me to the light of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. I asked him a question. I told him those days, in which you were doing whatever you wanted and you had access to every haram that you can. Were you happy? He thought for a moment, then he broke in tears. Mm -hmm. He told me, Sayyid, every morning I would lie to myself, telling myself, you're happy, you're happy. If you have access to all these desires, you're happy. But I was lying to myself. I swear by Allah, I was not happy. Now, now I'm happy because I have the true love of Imam Hussein in my heart. See, now he has a purpose. His purpose is to satisfy his Imam, wow. Imam Hussein. What does Imam Hussein teach me? Imam Hussein teaches me to sacrifice, say no to injustice. Imam Hussein teaches me to take care of the oppressed. Now he has a sense of purpose. He says, now I'm happy. Even though I'm not following my desires anymore, my life may be boring to those party people, but I'm much happier than I was. Finding that purpose is what will give you happiness. Ask yourself, who brought me to this world? How long am I staying? Where am I going? And am I prepared for this trip or no? Mm. Have I packed what I need? Mm -hmm. Sajjad, what's, irony, what's ironic is that sometimes when you want to go on a vacation for a week, have you seen how much research people do? 
they research the destinations, the hotels. I know some people that spend hours reading the reviews of the hotels and the reviews of the restaurants and the activities. For one week, you'll put in 10, 20 hours of research. But for that final journey, we're not willing. That's the sad reality. See, because we don't feel that sense of purpose. You'll find that sense of purpose in your Lord. By remembering God, that He's managing, micromanaging the whole universe, you will be at rest. Mm -hmm. If something doesn't make sense, you're like, it's okay. I know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what He's doing. He's running this whole universe. It's fine. It's okay. I don't need to understand everything if I've come I trust Allah. That gives you a sense of purpose. And one of the most beautiful aspects of our lives that give us a sense of purpose is to know the Imam of our time and to serve the Imam of our time. Who is the Imam of our time today? Imam Al-Qaim Al-Qaim Imam Al-Mahdi Al-Qaim Ta'ala Faraja. We have an Imam. His birth is just around the corner. In a few days we'll be celebrating his beautiful Shalla. birth. Shalla. That gives you the best sense of purpose to know you have a leader, an Imam that you look up to and he's waiting for you to do that which is good. In reality, in reality, we're not waiting for the Imam. He's waiting for us. That gives you a sense of purpose. You want to make your Imam happy? Bring a smile to an orphan. Support a school. Donate to the poor. Donate to a religious project. Have the best akhlaq out there in society, the best character and attitude, such that when people look at you like, who does this person follow? Show me, I want to follow. That's how you bring a smile to the Imam of your time. Imam al-Mahdi wants justice. How much on a daily basis do we focus on social justice? You know how much injustice there is out there in the world? If you want purpose, go and see where is the injustice happening? How is it happening? And how can I combat that? We just talked about depression. Start in your community here in the Netherlands. These youth who are lost, confused, they're depressed, how can I help them? The hadith states, nothing is dearer to Allah than to bring happiness to the heart of a fellow believer. That will give you a purpose. Believe me, when you look at all of that, you're like, I don't have any free time. I have all these beautiful things that I can do. And when you see the smile that you put on people's faces, that night you'll sleep well, believe me. You'll, sp- you'll sleep peacefully because you know today you made a difference in, in the lives of people. But if I spent my entire day on my gadgets and my Xbox and my drugs and I don't know what, that night I will not have a comfortable sleep because I know deep down I wasted it. I didn't have a sense of purpose. So find that sense of purpose, especially in the Imam of your time. He inspires you. Dedicate your actions in his name. Every day ask Allah, oh Allah, hasten the reappearance of my Imam. You, you, imam, you want to fill the world with justice? I'll start with small little steps. I'll start with the justice of the self by stopping sins. Because every sin is an act of injustice. You want to bring justice? Start with your own self, with your own family. You know how much in, injustice happens in the family, Brother Sajjad? Husband abusing his wife, wife abusing her husband. Children not respecting their parents. Parents not dealing with their children in an appropriate way. We have toxic environments at home. You want a sense of purpose and to serve the Imam of your time? Bring a positive attitude in your house. Then you'll be able to do so in your society. This is the best way to find purpose, inshallah. Inshallah ta'ala. Beautifully to end this note with the only purpose we have nowadays, serving the Imam of our time, Imam Mahdi Ajjalullah ta'ala Farajah al-Sharif. And we've come to an end of this beautiful podcast where I have benefited so much from, learned so much from, and inshallah, the dear viewers as well. Thank you very much, Sayyidna, for honoring the first session of the Noor podcast by your uh, presence, of course, and your knowledge and teaching us so much. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you. And inshallah, we hope to have you many more times among us and host you here in the Netherlands. Inshallah. Inshallah. Thank you so much. It has been my honor to participate in this first Noor podcast. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless your efforts. I pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us all to inspire us all, especially our youth. We ask Allah to protect them. They go through very difficult challenges. 
and we must do our best to be there for them. Thank so you. thank you for hosting me and well, inshallah I will join you again in the near future. Inshallah the pleasure was ours. Thank you very much dear brothers and sisters. Dank jullie wel broeders en zusters voor het kijken. En uh, aangezien dit onze eerste editie is, ontvangen we graag feedback, reacties op wat er beter kan uh, om onszelf te kunnen ontwikkelen en jullie het beste te kunnen dienen. En ook de imam van onze tijd, inshallah wa ta'ala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.